I've been asked to say welcome. My name is Susanna Ram, and I am the head of the research unit to Women Culture of Society. And uh, please remember, uh, besides also being a news fellow. Um, and I'm super delighted to have this opportunity and be super happy to have Anthony also as part of our group. Anthony um, completed his uh, PhD in South Georgia, and before he came here, he held a position in the philosophy departments of the UC University at Kent State University, as well as the University of Oxford. His research has been published in journals across the fields of philosophy, psychiatry, and nursing. And he is a co-editor of the Oxford Handbook of Phenomological Psych Psychopathology, and he has also contributed to several other handbooks. There's a lot of other stuff here, but I think this will be enough for now, and you'll be amazed about, uh, about your expertise in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna, for the introduction, and thank you all for being here. So before I actually get into the presentation, we just have a brief introduction of a new group here at DS, the DS Minds Group. Uh, this is now founded by Suna Stevenson, Ed Baggs, and I. And we'd like to use this group to bring together people at DS, people across SDU, and then eventually, ideally, also some external partners as well, who work on the mind, ideally and preferably from kind of embodied, ecological, or inactive perspectives. Uh, so this includes people working in philosophy, psychology, and the cognitive sciences at the very minimum, but also people working in areas including things like education, anthropology, and so on. It's used, these kinds of approaches are used quite broadly. So to start with this, we have a speaker series, which starts in really two weeks. Ed is giving the first talk, uh, and he'll announce the series and let you know about the other speakers at that point. Uh, I've also been asked to start a reading group, which I think we'll do. Uh, on being in time, so if you're interested in the question of the meaning of being through a 600-page slog and lots of intellectual <laughs> suffering, then uh, you're welcome to join us on this, but we'll send out an email at some point to see who's interested in joining. Okay, so with that being said, I guess I'll get started with the presentation. I really have three aims here. The first is to give you a brief introduction to the field of applied phenomenology and clarify what the relationship is between philosophical phenomenology on the one hand, so philosophical tradition going all the way back to around 1900, and then applied phenomenology, which I'll just define here as any case where you take some kind of insight or resource from the philosophical program, and then you use it in a field outside of philosophy. So it's a fairly broad umbrella term here. After introducing this, I'll give you some examples from my own research on how I've contributed to this area of applied phenomenology, and thinking about how these insights from this philosophical program end up feeding into uh, empirical work in other fields across the human sciences. And also a bit about how that kind of research, this empirical research, might feed back into philosophy. Although we're spending a lot more time talking about the direction from philosophy into other fields, since I assume the vast majority of you are non-philosophers, so I'm sure that's how you identify. And we'll work from there. But I do have at least some discussion of how some of this empirical work might actually feed back into philosophical things. And I'll also come to the point of talking more about how my research can contribute to fields like sports science and rehabilitation studies. So I am in a department of sports science and clinical biomechanics, but all of my background is in philosophy. And I've done a lot of collaborative work with psychiatrists and with clinical psychologists and then with nurses. So I think I've been moving closer and closer to topics that are of interest to people working in sports science and rehabilitation therapy. Uh, but one thing I've realized here, right, I'm starting from a philosophical field where we ask questions like, why is there something rather than nothing? And <laughs> what do we mean by being? And what is true? And now I'm in a department where people mostly ask questions like, how do we get people to exercise more? And what are the health benefits of exercise? And there seems to be a kind of potential missing link here. Uh, and in addition to this, just kind of at a more personal level, it seems like everyone I meet, as I keep meeting people throughout my department, everyone had a former career as some kind of elite athlete, and competed at a national or international level, uh, which is a little difficult for me because this is the last time I ever played a sport. <laughs> um, that's for very good reason. I have the hand-eye coordination of a sightless fish 
<laughs> I did try playing Little League Baseball, but I never actually hit a ball. <laughs> and I only caught a ball once accidentally trying to protect my face. <laughs> so, this is all to my father's eternal shame because he loves baseball and he was my assistant coach. Uh, so putting all my childhood trauma to the side, we'll turn to something that I might actually be good at. <laughs> So philosophical phenomenology, and the term phenomenology in a really broad sense just means something like the study of phenomena, which would refer to just about anything. And it does get used across a wide variety of disciplines with lots of different meanings. Now in philosophy, it also has quite a few different meanings, but we often refer, when we use the word phenomenology within philosophy, we often refer to a particular tradition that starts with the work of Edmund Husserl and emerges out of of another discipline called descriptive psychology. Um, Husserl even kind of characterized his early work as a kind of descriptive psychology and then eventually took on his label of phenomenology and recharacterized what he meant by this. But it's a tradition that is a bit difficult to define because even within Husserl's own work, it goes through a number of transformations over time. And then there's lots of other philosophers who would typically characterize as phenomenologists. This includes some of Husserl's students, like Edith Stein and Martin Heidegger, but then also lots of other followers of Husserl in some respects who weren't technically students, including a lot of the French existentialists, so people like Jean-Paul Sartre, Maurice Merleau ponty Simone de Beauvoir, uh, including as well as some of the philosophical hermeneuticists, people like Hans Georg Gadamer. And each of these figures, they do take up and progress this original philosophical program that Husserl started in a particular way, but they often also change things that Husserl probably wouldn't have been too happy about. So I think Paul Ricoeur, I think, characterizes this best. Um, he says something, and this is just paraphrasing, but he says something along the lines of, we can understand the history of phenomenology as the history of Husserlian heresies. So each time someone takes up phenomenology and pushes a little bit further, they often also do something that conflicts with some earlier characterization. So it becomes very difficult to give a definition. And in a lot of books about phenomenology, they absolutely refuse to give a definition. But I can't really leave you hanging like that, uh, especially if I'm trying to contrast the philosophical approach with more applied and empirical approaches. So <clears throat> I'll give you a definition, but just with the caveat that I don't think this characterizes everything that goes on under the heading of phenomenology. But I do think it captures quite a bit of what goes on in the history of phenomenology and in contemporary phenomenology. And you'll see definitions like this pop up here and there. We can say that it's described as the study of the universal structures of experience and subjectivity. And when we say that it's universal, this is partly just saying that phenomenology is still very much part of the tradition of philosophy. Right? If we go all the way back to ancient Greece, for instance, and look at the kinds of philosophical questions that these ancient Greek philosophers are asking, they're asking things like, what is truth? What is beauty? What is justice? What is the good life? And when they ask these questions, they're not asking things like, what do ancient Greeks think or is beautiful? Or even, how do ancient Greeks conceptualize beauty? Right? If those were the conclusions they came to, then philosophically that would have been a kind of failed project. Uh, it might be very interesting, sociologically or anthropologically, but philosophically we usually consider that to be a failure. And most of the history of philosophy has this orientation toward things that we consider to be universal or essential. And in some of the phenomenological literature, you'll see when we talk about structures of experience, and I'll explain a little more what this is in just a second, but you'll often see them characterized as universal or as essential or as invariant. Now, there's a long list of structural features of subjectivity or of experience that phenomenologists study. This is just a kind of sampling of one, some of the ones that receive the most attention. But to clarify here, when a phenomenologist says that they study, for instance, affectivity, or the effective life of the subject. They aren't asking questions like, what is the difference between your effective state and my effective state? They're not even usually asking questions like, what kind of effective states are characteristic of this population of people versus that population? <coughs> Instead, they'd be interested in asking questions like, what are the variety or the classes of effective states that are possible to have? In a very, very broad sense, thinking things like, what is the difference between a mood and an emotion? And typically, in this case, they might say, well, emotions are effective states that have an object within the world. They're what we call intentional, which means object-directed or oriented towards something. So if I have an emotion, it can be about a person, 
or a state of affairs or an event, or even the absence of something, but it's directed. Whereas we often characterize moods as something more like a diffuse background affective state, right? a way of being attuned to the world, a way of being effectively situated in the world. And our moods might be caused by something, but they don't have an object in the way that emotion does. It's often a kind of characterization or type distinction that's drawn in the phenomenological literature. And that goes for all of these, right? We don't, these are kind of umbrella terms that incorporate a number of what we can think of as structures or substructures of subjectivity. So when we're talking about these things, we're still operating at this uh, universal level. level. At, least, at least that's kind of the aim, right? We might get things wrong, of course. But the aim is that if you're articulating the difference between moods and emotions, you're not trying to say, well, some of us have this difference between moods and emotions and other cultural groups might not. Right? That's not the kind of philosophical claim we want to make here. We're trying to give an account of the general structural features that apply equally to all experiencing subjects, or at least all human subjects. Now, in addition to these structures of subjectivity or experience being universal, we often characterize them as being pre-reflective. And the pre-reflective here isn't the same as referring to something as unconscious or as non-conscious. Instead, phenomenologists use a fairly rich notion of consciousness and argue that there are many features of our conscious experience that are, in the sense, of the background of conscious experience or the background of awareness and can be brought into the foreground in various cases. But they're not completely outside of that. They're not in the kind of unconscious and the non-conscious realm. So one of the clearest examples of this is how phenomenologists talk about embodiment. They tend to argue that in our everyday life, if I'm walking to work or I'm having a conversation with a friend, my body fades from my awareness. It's kind of in the background of my awareness. We characterize it as tacit or as implicit. And because it fades into the background, I'm able to do all kinds of other things. I tend my awareness toward objects in my world, be concerned about seeing what's going to happen the next day, and so on. I can do all of this while being bodily engaged in my world. My body has faded into the background. But there are also all kinds of instances where my body then moves into the foreground of my awareness. If I'm walking to work, but there's a small rock in my shoe, my attention is pulled away from my environment and pulled into my own body. And it becomes quite difficult to even attend to things outside of myself. I might be start, start to attend very carefully to the precise movement of my foot and trying to get this little rock out of the way or something like that. But that would be an unusual way of experiencing our own bodies. And this kind of objectification can also occur in cases where you say, just look at yourself in the mirror while doing your makeup or combing your hair. Or if you trip and stumble and you're embarrassed. There's all kinds of different ways in which your body can enter the foreground of your awareness. But there's this polarity that goes back and forth of things that are pre-reflective and then move into the foreground. And we tend to say that phenomenology operates first personally or from a first person perspective. And for our purposes, I think all we really need to focus on here is that when phenomenologists study experience, they're not concerned with identifying, say, neural correlates to experience, either to experience in general or to particular experiences. There are phenomenologists who collaborate with cognitive scientists and neuroscientists and so on to do this kind of research. But in virtue of being a phenomenologist, they're typically interested in describing and articulating these basic structures of experience, not in explaining the causal sources of them. They do this by relying on first-person reflective abilities. So if that's what philosophical phenomenology is, and how can we understand applied phenomenology? Well, again, I said I have a stipulated definition I'll operate with here for applied phenomenology is any case where we take some insight or resource from that philosophical tradition and we put it to use in a field outside of philosophy. So there's lots of different ways to do this. And this is typically applied to what we call the human sciences, and here I'm including the social sciences, psychological sciences, and at least some of the health sciences including things like nursing and rehabilitation therapy. Now, when phenomenology is taken up and put to use in these fields, there's lots of different ways that this gets done. Because for the most part, these applications were not initiated by philosophers. It's not that a philosophically trained phenomenologist then said, oh, I'm going to enter the field of anthropology or of psychiatry or sports science and figure out how I can take the philosophical work that I've been doing and start to use it in this more empirical scientific field. 
Instead, what typically happens is that someone working in this field who's interested in understanding and studying experience finds that they're running into issues and finding the right kinds of resources to understand experience, to study experience, and looking through potential theoretical foundations in various fields, including philosophy, they might hit upon phenomenology. And then you see an approach to phenomenology emerge within that field that often develops independently of how phenomenology has been used in other fields. So there's kind of independent strands of the way phenomenology gets applied in anthropology, in sociology, and so on. Sociology is actually one of the exceptions where we do have a kind of story we can tell about a philosophically trained phenomenologist taking phenomenology into the field of sociology. But for many of these fields, that's not the case. It's initiated by someone outside of philosophy who finds an interest and then tries to take what they can in the philosophical field. And sometimes they do that by engaging with living philosophers. And I think those tend to be more productive ways of using phenomenology in these fields. But in a lot of cases, this development of a phenomenological approach in, say, anthropology, for instance, is developed by reading a lot of this philosophical text, but not necessarily engaging with a lot of people working in phenomenology and philosophy departments. And there you end up with something that often looks a bit different from what we're doing in the philosophical context. So there are lots of different ways to do this. And they tend to take different things. So in anthropology, for instance, they'll typically say that phenomenology is a theory. And they might use this general notion of the relationship between reflective and pre-reflective experience as something that's kind of in the background of all of their work. It's a theoretical foundation for their work. In psychiatry and the cognitive sciences, they tend to use very specific concepts. So there's a lot of psychiatric research that's done on schizophrenia, and a lot of that research relies specifically on certain distinctions that phenomenologists draw among different senses of self or what we mean by self -work. And they examine precisely how the sense of self can alter in schizophrenia and other psychotic conditions. Then, for certain applications that are more kind of strictly qualitative in orientation, including some approaches to qualitative psychology, they tend to see philosophical phenomenology as a methodological resource. Uh, that's an approach that I tend to move away from, and typically one who would rely primarily on the kind of conceptual approach, thinking that what philosophical phenomenology offers is a lot of really good conceptual clarification and conceptual foundation. Uh, one of the reasons I typically move away from using methods is because I think the aims of philosophical phenomenology differ in fundamental respects from the aims applied phenomenology, at least in most cases, even though superficially it might seem like they're somewhat similar. And this is because most of these fields are concerned with studying the experiences of particular subjects in contrast with subjectivity in this kind of universal or essentialist way. So even if you have a philosophical phenomenologist and applied phenomenologist, and they both, for instance, want to study emotions, the philosophical phenomenologist, again, is probably going to be more interested in articulating what we mean by an emotion in the first place, or what an emotion is, and how an emotion differs from other kinds of affective states, like moods and other kinds of feelings. Whereas if you are a kind of qualitative phenomenological psychologist, you might be interested in describing particular emotions that people have, or you might be interested in identifying what kinds of emotions people tend to have among certain populations or certain groups. So there's still a continuity here. But those are two very different kinds of questions. And I think we shouldn't assume that the methods developed to answer the philosophical question are also the methods we should be using to answer these more applied or empirical questions. Uh, if it happens to work, the method works in both cases, it's just kind of a happy accident, I think. Okay, so that's a brief introduction to the relationship between philosophical phenomenology and applied phenomenology. So I'll now jump into some examples from my own work. And I'm just going to focus here on work that I've done in an interdisciplinary and collaborative way. So in philosophy, we mostly sit in a room by ourselves and write papers all alone. Uh, and I still do plenty of that. But I've also done quite a bit of collaborative work. So I'll give you some examples. So these are some qualitative studies that I participated in. Uh, these are run by Giovanni Stangolini and his research group. And Stengelini is trained in so a psychiatrist, uh, but also trained in philosophy. And he has this huge pile of clinical data from John Cutting, one of the other authors, where Cutting is a retired British psychiatrist. And Cutting was able to conduct these fairly extensive interviews, about an hour and a half with each <coughs> patient. And we give about 550 of these interviews, and we have the notes from these interviews, so I don't believe the exact transcripts. And 
Spangolini now has all of this data and was able to digitize it, but for a qualitative study that's massive, it's just too much to sit there and read through the results of 550 interviews and analyze all of them together. So you need some way to break this down. And it's a mix of patients, some of them diagnosed with affective disorders, primarily major depressive disorders, and then those diagnosed with schizophrenia and spectrum disorders. So to start, I pick one of these two disorders, major depression or schizophrenia, and then also pick one of these key structural features. So that could be spatiality or temporality or affectivity or embodiment. And then you say, okay, so we're just gonna pick out the participants in this study who meet the criteria for major depressive disorder, and then we're just gonna pull out all of the notes that we have about how they report their experiences with their own body. So then you end up with a still substantial, but more manageable amounts of qualitative data here, and a clear frame, right? <coughs> one aspect of the experience that you want to investigate. So my role in this research, I was brought on later, this is a project he's had ongoing for quite a while, and there's a lot of other articles uh, that I haven't participated in that are conducted in a similar way. But in this case, I'm primarily brought on to do first this kind of conceptual clarification. So to do a lot of the work in writing up the introductory material and background sections to clarify, for instance, what do phenomenologists mean by embodiment? Or what do phenomenologists mean by space or spatiality? And in doing this work, there's a difficult line to walk because on the one hand, I want to be able to articulate these concepts in a way that's faithful to the philosophical text, which is quite difficult because any of these concepts could easily be the topic of an entire semester-long graduate seminar or a PhD thesis, and you would get nowhere near exhausting all the text you might read on this. So I had to figure out a way to condense that into a kind of introduction and background section, and also write it in a way that's accessible to psychiatrists and clinical psychologists who don't know what phenomenology is. Uh, so that's quite the challenge, and I work with them a lot on figuring out ways to articulate these things in an accessible fashion. And then also, then collaborate with them on writing up the discussion section because I also have a uh, background in the history of phenomenological psychiatry, which starts off all the way back in 1912 with the work of Carl Jaspers. So one of the things we wanted to do with this empirical work is bring it into dialogue with the history of phenomenological psychiatry and contemporary work in this field as well. Because while we do have really careful analyses of a lot of these conditions in the phenomenological literature, it often relies on detailed case studies. It might be an individual case study or a case study involving just a few patients, or we just get kind of snippets and anecdotes of a psychiatrist interactions with their patients. So there's a sense in which it is still relying on first-person reports and so on, but it's not all that systematic. And when you're trying to generalize and make a claim that's not about this patient or this small sample of patients, but instead about everyone who for instance meets the diagnostic category of schizophrenia, then it's helpful to have a lot more data here. We wanted to bring this data and the analyses into dialogue with these anecdotal accounts. So in this respect, uh, quite a few times we find that it does align with what we found that might add a bit to it. In other cases, we find things that are a mismatch or maybe perhaps there's some report about one's experience that we don't actually find in some of the earlier work. So there's lots of different ways in which this is brought into dialogue here. But that's kind of part of the work that I do with them. It's also bringing in the history of this field and trying to see how this actually pushes the research area forward. Now, like I said, with those studies, I was brought on more kind of on the tail end uh, after they had done at least the initial analysis of the data. But I've also collaborated with other researchers in the design of qualitative methods. Uh, specifically methods that are intended to more tightly integrate philosophical phenomenology with empirical qualitative research. So I've worked here on this with Alan Koster, who's uh, trained in both philosophy and psychology, and he works as a researcher at the Danish National Center for Grief in Copenhagen. And then also with Mariana Klinke, uh, who was a practicing nurse and is now a professor of neurological nursing at the University of Iceland, who works primarily on uh, hemispatial neglect following stroke. So I'll just give you some brief accounts of the kind of framework that we developed in this first article. So if you look at the way that a lot of qualitative researchers draw on philosophical phenomenology, again, like I said before, they often use it as a method or a methodological resource. And one of the key methodological points of phenomenology is this ability to bracket out or otherwise suspend presuppositions that might get in the way of providing a clear account or description of the experience you're studying. 
So they often adopt this into their approach and say, when you go into a study, you should find a way to kind of bracket as many presuppositions as you can about the research topic so that you're not um, you know, setting things up so that you just go into it and discover what you already put there. And again, I think qualitative methods differ quite a bit on the extent to which you're supposed to include or not include presuppositions, or whether you're supposed to kind of suspend presuppositions or just become aware of your presuppositions. There's a lot of different approaches here. But a lot of the phenomenological work is about suspending these presuppositions. Now, the work that I've done here with Koster and with Klinke, both of them are very much experts on the topics they're researching, in this case, grief and also any spatial neglect. And I think in those cases, it seems kind of absurd to ask someone with that much research expertise to suspend their prior knowledge about the topic so that they can discover something new. There are, of course, cases where I think suspending your presuppositions can be very useful. But the kind of approach that I'm working on here, especially in the work with, with Alan Coaster, is one where we want to find a way to kind of harness the expertise of the researcher and put it to use without problematically predetermining the results of the study. And we do this by relying on these basic structural features. And we say, look, what you can do here, I'll be, I'll, this is easier if I just start with an example. I'll use the example of some of Alan's work that we discussed in this article. So Alan was looking at a lot of the literature on the effective aspects of grief. And he found that we understand the emotional aspects of grief very well. They will be referred to as waves or pains of grief. They tend to be intense and coming from short waves. And they have a clear object. The object is the lost loved one. And in the psychological literature, this is articulated very much. But if you look at other literature outside of the psychological literature, if you look at memoirs and other kinds of first person reports, you'll often find that people are referring not just to changes in their emotional life, but also to other changes in their affective life that seem to be something about a more diffuse background state. Right, so they'll refer to long-term changes in their effective disposition toward the world, their, their ability to be effectively attuned to the world. And they don't describe this in much detail, but there are these kind of subtle references to it. So he decided that he wanted to do a qualitative study, or at least one part of the study, was to explore this aspect of the effective life of people who have grieved. And in this case, he was studying early parental bereavement, so people who are adults but who lost a parent when they were a child. And in this way, by having this clear distinction between, again, these kind of intentional object-directed effective states and these non-intentional background diffuse effective states, he was able to say, it's these background effective states I want to study, and used phenomenological accounts of this from the work of people like Martin Heidegger, but also contemporary phenomenologists like Matthew Radcliffe, who articulates a concept that he calls existential feeling, which overlaps quite a bit with this classic concept of mood. He uses these concepts to then design an interview guide. and assist, in a sense, the participants in referring to that or describing that aspect of their experience. So the key here is that he's not predetermining the content of what they say. Right? He's not going in and asking them to describe a particular background effective state, but he is going into the process asking them to reflect on this aspect of their experience as opposed to their emotional life. So it's a way of directing participants in order to get them to talk about aspects of experience that if you just went in there and asked about affectivity in general, people are much more likely to end up just talking about their emotions. We're much more acquainted with our emotions. And that's typically because emotions change over more quickly and uh, they might be more intense. So it's the kind of thing that is more easily forefronted in our experience. But there's lots of aspects of our experience that are, as I described earlier, pre-reflected. And we can reflect upon them, but it's often difficult to do so. You need to give someone quite a bit of space and sometimes some prompting in order to reflect on that aspect of their experience and then describe it to you. He found here that uh, <coughs> people reported what he ends up calling world distancing. Let's see if this ever comes back. Uh, what people call world distancing, and he's now doing some work to distinguish world distancing from uh, similar states that seem to occur in cases like major depression. There we go. Yeah. So, just briefly then, we've begun to develop this project a bit more and because it has this kind of conceptual framing, 
it's something that can be adapted for lots of other approaches as well. We don't necessarily characterize this as kind of a full qualitative approach. There's lots of other work we have to do on uh, how exactly you want to conduct interviews, analyze data within this framework. But I think that the piece that we describe here is very much about how to design a study. And that can be uh, something that you link up with a variety of other approaches. Then my work with Mariana Klinka, in that work, we point out that there are lots of conditions that phenomenologists might like to study, but it's difficult to study them because you can't accurately reflect on your own experience and you can't report it. Cases that involve, for instance, confabulation in neurological disorders. So in this case of looking at hemispatial neglect, which is a condition that often occurs after a stroke, maybe not that often, but more often than we think, and in hemispatial neglect, we often describe it as a disorder of attention you have trouble attending some aspect of your experience. But what it comes down to is that you often behave as if half of the world does not exist. Right? If you serve someone a plate of food with any special neglect, they eat all the food on one side of the plate, and they don't know that there's another side of the plate to eat food off of. If you ask them to draw a clock, they draw a kind of strange circle with all the numbers condensed onto just one side, and they think that they, they report that they've drawn a clock correctly. If you show them this, then a couple months later, when they're partially recovered, they look at that and they go, how could I ever have thought that I drew this clock correctly, but this also means there's not a lot of insight into their own experience, so they can't describe it to you. So one thing we argue here is that because phenomenology also characterizes embodiment as fundamentally expressive, we're not limited to just using written, verbal, or written or verbal reports. We can also, of course, do qualitative research that relies to some degree on observations of behavior. And we'll talk about how this might be integrated with also interviews. So moving now into the field of nursing, uh, this is what I'll just refer to as a kind of conceptual intervention. So this isn't necessarily dealing with qualitative research, although it might have implications for the way we do qualitative work. It also has clear implications for how we set up nursing education and training programs and to some extent kind of practice as well. So I was working on a project starting a couple years ago with Dan Zahavi, who's the head of the Center for Subjectivity Research in Copenhagen. And we wanted to look into how phenomenology has been used specifically in the field of nursing, but also more broadly in quality health research. And we found by looking at the nursing literature that there's a lot of conceptual confusion around the concept of empathy. So if you talk to nursing researchers and also practicing nurses, almost invariably, everyone will agree that empathy is key to effective nursing practice. Uh, that's not something that you necessarily get from physicians, but nurses tend to agree that empathy is key. What they don't agree on is what they mean by empathy. So everyone's agreed that this is absolutely essential to your practice, but nobody agrees what they mean by the term in the first place. And I don't think this is actually all that unusual for aspects of everyday life, right? We, all, we might all agree that art is central to a good human life, but we're gonna disagree on what counts as art. We might all agree that justice is central to a good community, but we might disagree on what counts as justice. But in a scientific field, you'd hope that we can agree on the meaning of our terms and what, how we should be using those. So I started looking into the history of nursing, which is a lot of fun to look into because it's a research field that's so recent, only going back to about the 50s or 60s. You can kind of trace the development of a lot of these concepts and see where they originally started and how they altered and so on. But at least in the contemporary literature, a lot of the debate around empathy and nursing centers on this one distinction between emotional empathy and cognitive empathy. They import this from more theoretical work that's done in psychology and in the cognitive sciences. So just to give you a very brief definition of each, we typically characterize emotional empathy as something that's kind of intuitive or immediate, and we understand someone by, at least in some respect, reproducing how they feel. Right? So I see someone who's sad, and in a sense, I kind of feel their sadness, and I understand them as sad because of that. On the other hand, in cognitive empathy, that's something that uses higher level cognitive functions. One example of some kind of practice that relies on cognitive empathy is imaginative perspective taking. Right? This idea that in order to understand someone's experience, I should imagine myself into the situation that they find themselves in and see what it would be like for me. But also just aspects of critical thinking and so on. There's lots of stuff that goes on under the label of cognitive empathy. So there's this debate about which of these two kinds of empathy is really most important for nursing practice. And there's concerns that emotional empathy is actually a bit dangerous. Even though it's kind of quick and intuitive, there's 
the worry that it's going to be overwhelming and lead to things like burnout. If you're treating someone who's in extreme pain and you're supposed to somehow feel with them, this seems like not the kind of thing that you should let yourself do. And there's a lot of critical work in nursing, in medicine, in psychology against this version of empathy. And sometimes they just think that this is empathy and they write books called things like Against Empathy. Um, cognitive empathy, on the other hand, is something that we tend to think of as trainable. Right? So if you're thinking about developing a training program for nurses as part of a broader education program on empathy, you're typically going to say that you're training cognitive empathy. There are some who argue that you can also train emotional empathy, but most of the time they say we can train cognitive empathy. And yes, it's kind of a bit slower in some sense, but it maintains the safe distance. So Zahavi and I looked at this and argued that actually this is kind of a, a false dichotomy in a sense that they're missing a whole other kind of empathy, at least one other kind of empathy, probably many other kinds. And if we insert this account of empathy into the debate, it might resolve some of the confusion. So we're not necessarily saying, look, we're just going to give you a new concept, and this concept is going to fix everything for you. Um, but we are providing what we think of as a more basic, a more fundamental concept that these two actually rely upon. This is what we call basic empathy. Um, and this goes all the way back to the work of Edmund Husserl and some of the other early phenomenologists, Shaler and Stein, for instance. But these phenomenologists argue that we don't typically understand other people either emotionally or cognitively. Instead, we have what they sometimes just refer to as other perception. Right? The way that I experience a table or a chair is fundamentally different from the way that I experience a human body, because I experience human bodies as first and foremost expressive. I immediately perceive someone's boredom, for instance, while giving this talk, or uh, someone's joy, or their anxiety, or I can even perceive their intentions to some degree. Right? So you can perceive things like desires and intentions and feelings and that's just how we naturally interact with each other, perceive each other. And we don't really need to feel what someone else is feeling in order to know what they're feeling. I think that's kind of a false characterization of what's going on in a lot of these cases. Um, here's just a simple example of that. If you're walking down the street, you bump into someone and they throw their arms up and yell something, you might immediately perceive them as angry. You might also feel anger. Uh, but is it really the case that you feeling anger helps you feel their anger or understand their anger? Right? Th that seems like an unlikely case. You might very well feel fear in a situation. If you feel fear, you also understand their anger just as well, not better. So a lot of these things that we think of as allowing us to understand someone else are actually a reaction to having already understood them through what we call basic empathy. So we argue that you shouldn't actually be so concerned about this intuitive empathy, at least, being something that's going to be overwhelming or lead to burnout, because you don't necessarily have to reproduce someone else's feeling in order to understand them in this intuitive way. And we argue that, well, if we start thinking about empathy in this way, as more of basic empathy, then this changes how we need to think about training programs in the field of nursing for it, as empathy training programs. And one thing we point out is that basic empathy isn't really the kind of thing that can be trained in the sense that cognitive empathy can, if you just have basic empathy. But it is the kind of thing that can be obstructed. So if you rely too much on, say, a certain theoretical framework, right? if you're interacting with a psychotherapist who's very much committed to this one psychotherapeutic theory about how to interpret everything the patient says, then in this context, they may very well not allow themselves to be open to perceiving what you're really expressing and instead always have some way of reinterpreting that. Or if you engage in some kind of cognitive empathy, uh, if you rely too much on cognitive empathy, there's the possibility that you might say, I'm going to try to understand this person by imagining what it would be like if I were in their situation. But you're a different person with a different history, different values, different dispositions. And you might experience that same exact situation in a very different way, which doesn't really help you get at what their experience is like. So we argue that if we're going to rely on this concept of basic empathy as ability of basic empathy. And we should think about nursing education programs, they train empathy as something that's really more about facilitating basic empathy by finding ways to unobstruct it. And we've written other work on this. We have another short piece in nurse education today that's specifically about the educational implications of this kind of concept and inserting it to the field of nursing. So we've moved a bit closer now to things like sports science and rehabilitation therapy by moving from psychiatry into nursing. Let's talk more about <coughs> this field. 
Um, and this is a project uh, seen a few colleagues. We have this in review right now um, at the Cancer Society. And this is with Sarah Pinney and Sina Van Beer Larson, who are not here today, as well as Susanna Brown. And we propose this study that's going to rely on philosophical phenomenology as the conceptual foundation, while also using both ethnographic methods for observation and also semi structured interviews. And the idea here is to look at the role of physical rehabilitation, physical activity for cancer survivors, for young cancer survivors, young adults, 18 to 39. And by looking at a lot of the literature on the role of both your rehabilitation programs and the role of engaging physical activity while recovering from cancer, we find that there are kind of hints here and there of people referring to this being valuable for them because it allows them to kind of take up things that they were previously able to do they were previously able to do, but were lost the ability to do during the course of undergoing cancer treatments, or being able to potentially pick up new skills that allow them to do things. So the idea here is to look at how engaging in physical activity is a way of rehabilitating not just your physical body, but also your sense of self, including what we think of as personal and social identities. Because in the course of going through cancer treatment, often you're not able to fulfill a lot of obligations to people like friends and family loved ones and so on and colleagues. So your identity as say uh, a student might fall away. Your identity as you know, a reliable father might fall away. And these are kinds of identities that you're required to engage in certain kinds of physical practices in order to maintain and to develop. So the idea is to think more about the role that physical activity and physical rehabilitation will play in restoring one's sense of self following cancer treatment. And for this, we intend to incorporate a few different phenomenological concepts, including concepts of embodied agency and narrative selfhood, and thinking very much about the relationship between how regaining a sense of embodied agency over time can play a role in shaping the kinds of narratives that you have about yourself. And then using this also in conjunction with doing some ethnographic field work, to then develop these semi structured interviews and conduct those with cancer patients and cancer survivors. So, that's what I got for you today. Thanks so much. <laughs>